Good evening, everyone. My name is Scott Kratz, and uh, I am the Vice President for Education here at the National Building Museum. And I'm tremendously excited about tonight's program, Planning for a Chinese Future, which is the eighth in our series called For the Greener Good, Conversations That Can Change the World. The goal of this series is to bring together the world's leading experts from different disciplines to discuss sustainability and the built environment. Tonight's program is certainly timely as it examines plans for the 2008 Summer Olympics in Beijing, specifically looking at how do you create new buildings that are hopefully environmentally sustainable while at the same time preserving historic architecture in one of the world's cradles of civilization. While many of the new buildings going up in Beijing right now are designed by Western architects, how do you ensure that China's impressive vernacular designs are incorporated to continue its unique sense of place? What can America learn from China's example as we grapple with how to best preserve our own architectural heritage um, as more and more emphasis goes into building new sustainable buildings? China is building right now is spending $38 billion to date on the Olympic Games and related projects. What an opportunity to create a new series of walkable communities, affordable housing, and public transit. What will the legacy, legacy be of this enormous effort? Um, I have two particular thank yous that I'd like to have um, the, before we begin this program as well. I would like to thank Jeff Sewell from the American Planning Association, who I know um, is in the audience, um, I think. Um, thank you, Jeff, up front. Um, as well as Yuan Yu, um, also from the American Planning Association. Um, they helped identify um, the, they helped brainstorm topics for this program, as well as identify several of the panelists. Yuan Yu is also up here on stage, and uh, they has been so kind um, to um, do many things um, for the, to help this program come together, but um, serve as translator as well. So thank you both to Jeff and Yuan and the American Planning Association. Um, we've assembled an impressive panel representing a wide view of a wide range of viewpoints and experiences tonight, and I know we're going to have a fantastic discussion. And these discussions are designed to incorporate your questions and thoughts, so they're designed to be conversational in nature. Periodically, our moderator will break um, for some questions from the audience, and then we'll conclude for questions in the audience as well. The For the Greener Good series is presented by the museum's sustainability partner, the Home Depot Foundation, and we would like to thank them for their generous support of this innovative lecture series. If you like, and if you like what you hear and experience tonight, um, I'd invite you to uh, two of our upcoming programs. Tomorrow we celebrate not only Shakespeare's birthday, um, but we also are celebrating 10 years of our Smart Growth Lecture Series sponsored by the Environmental Protection Agency. Harriet Tregonig, the director of the DC Office of Planning, will be here discussing um, the Smart Growth Movement um, at a free noontime lecture program. And then in May, we will feature the renowned Japanese architect Shigeru Ban, who is traveling to the United States with 10 architectural students from Keio University. These students are, will be collaborating with students from the University of Virginia to construct one of Bond's paper houses on the museum's west lawn. And at noon on May 8th, Bond will be here with the students and Dean of, Ar Dean of the Architecture Program at the University of Virginia, Karen Van Lingen, um, and the students from UVA um, will be here giving a public presentation. So um, that's free and we encourage you to attend. Before we begin this program, it's tremendously helpful for the panelists up here to get an idea of who is in the audience. Um, it will help uh, give them an idea of who they're speaking to. Um, can I ask everyone just by a show of hands to raise your hands if you're architects? Great, wonderful. Uh, planners? Wonderful. Landscape architects? Great. Uh, engineers? And journalists? Students? Great. Um, federal or state employees? Did I forget anybody? Any, any civilians? Or any civilians at all in the audience? <laughs> all civilians, right? Um, well, that's great. Um, with that, I would like to introduce tonight's moderator, who will in turn introduce each of the panelists, um, who will be, give brief five-minute presentations, and then we'll get straight to the conversation. Paul Goldberger is the architecture critic for The New Yorker, where since 1997 he has written the magazine's celebrated Skyline column. He also holds the Joseph Urban Chair in Design uh, and Architecture at the New School in New York City. He was formerly Dean of Parsons School of Design, a division of the New School. He began his career at the New York Times, where in 1984, his architecture criticism was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for Distinguished Criticism, the highest award in journalism. 
Um, the, one of his most recent New Yorker um, articles uh, that just came out a couple weeks ago um, was on airport designs on the new terminals in both Beijing and Madrid. With that, please welcome Paul Goldberger. Thank you very much, Scott. It's a great, great pleasure to be back here at the Building Museum, especially with such an extraordinary panel concluding this, this wonderful series. Uh, the Olympics have historically been a building competition almost as much as they've been an athletic competition. And however, unlike athletic events, the buildings are around long after the 16 days come to an end. Um, when you put that together with the extraordinary rate of construction in China, and in Beijing in, in particular, I think it's inevitable that, that something notable would happen. Uh, so over the next uh, hour, hour and a half, we will explore this from as many standpoints as we, we possibly can. The whole question of what has happened in Beijing, how it's happened, what it means, and how good it is. And I hope, look at it, a little bit in the context of Olympic construction over the years, but more importantly and almost more urgently, look at it in the context of Beijing itself right now, which is a city that uh, is, among other things, constructing, I think, five of the most important buildings going up anywhere in the world today. Uh, the, uh, New Airport by Norman Foster, which, as uh, Scott mentioned, I've just written about. Uh, Stephen Hall's complex of apartment towers, Rem Koolhaas's CCTV headquarters, and Herzog and de Moron's National Stadium and PTW Architects uh, National Aquatic Center, the water cube. Only the last two, of course, are Olympic buildings, but all of them are reshaping the city at this amazing and extraordinary time. Anyway, it's a great pleasure to have this panel here. Uh, let me introduce all three of them now so that they can then more seamlessly move up and give you their introductory remarks. Um, first, uh, Dennis Peepers, who is the president of Sasaki Associates in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and plays a significant role in the firm's notable urban design practice. He's an architect and urban designer who was educated at Harvard and the University of Toronto, is currently working in India, China, Vietnam, and Abu Dhabi, but most important for our purposes tonight, he was the lead partner on the firm's entry into the competition to create a master plan for the Olympic Green, for the Olympic location in Beijing, an entry that won. So he is, in fact, the planner of the Olympics. Um, he also is a notable scholar, advisor, and commentator on urban design issues all around the world. Um, Ma Liangwei is also with us. He is the deputy director of the Beijing Municipal Institute of City Planning and Design. And he was the official at the city end who was in charge of Olympic planning. He's also played a key role in numerous other Beijing planning efforts. Uh, he is uh, including the Beijing Central City Control Plan. Um, he is a Beijing-based planning official with an international reach. In fact, we're very lucky that uh, one of the reasons we have him here tonight is that he's en route to the American Planning Association Convention this year in Las Vegas. Um, a city that has some resemblance to Beijing, but not too much, you might say. Anyway, and he will 
give us a short overview of the situation from the standpoint of, from his vantage point as the public official in charge. And finally, uh, Wang Jun, uh, distinguished journalist in China, a graduate of Renmin University. He went in 1991, upon his graduation, to uh, the Tsinghua News Agency, where he was assigned to cover uh, city construction and planning in Beijing. Uh, historians of Beijing and observers of architecture in China will consider that one of the luckiest news assignments since uh, maybe the Washington Post asked Woodward and Bernstein to look into a robbery because, in fact, uh, he became an impassioned student of the history of planning in Beijing, wrote a book called The Beijing Record that is considered the critical study of the evolution of Beijing since 1949. It's now, five years after its publication, being translated into English, uh, and has become uh, an essential and articulate advocate of historic preservation in Beijing. He's now doing a, another book called Journalist Notebook that is about current events in Beijing. So it's a great pleasure to invite all of them, or to welcome all of them here, and actually particularly for me to thank both Ma Liang Wei and Wang Jun, who so graciously hosted me when I was in Beijing quite recently. Uh, so it's wonderful to be able to invite, welcome you to one of our more modest buildings in America. Uh, anyway, Dennis, can you uh, begin with a quick overview of Olympic plans and, and the Sasaki plan? Okay. It's Well, since I only have uh, a very brief time, I will launch right into it. How do I uh, make it full screen? Um, oh, it's down there. Right. Um, the obviously the Olympics in Beijing is a monumental uh, event for China. And this was the night they were awarded the games in Tiananmen Square. And so you can imagine what's coming uh, this uh, August. Uh, and you know how important the Olympics for China is by the site that they picked, which was right on this axis, right on this uh, axis that goes from Tiananmen through the Forbidden City and heads north. So we were just looking at Tiananmen down there at the pink square in the middle, and it heads north out to the edge of the city where about a 2,300-acre site was laying fallow, undeveloped, uh, and obviously in reserve for some future great uh, civic uh, place. And that was the site that was chosen, and uh, an international competition which we were very fortunate to win. Uh, and uh, the site is interesting because of obviously its position in the city. Uh, nearby the site uh, was this place where the Asian Games were held in 1985. And when that happened, the area around this future Olympic site had an explosion of growth and development. Uh, and so we had to incorporate that into our design. One of the first things we did was look at the scale of the site, and it is huge. Uh, there you see on the top right Central Park. Uh, the whole of Central Park more or less fits in the core. The Washington DC Mall, uh, just on the bottom left. So you can see how big uh, this place is. Uh, we were very... Uh, concerned about making an Olympic area that would reflect China, that would be very much about China, not about Sydney, not about Barcelona or Atlanta, but all about Beijing. 
And so our scheme is all about, uh, a key element of the scheme is all about this axis. How to respond to this axis that connects the site back to the core of the city and hopefully Chinese culture. And here you see uh, Beihai Park, a very important park on the bottom left of that plan, almost equally in scale to this great new Olympic Park that would be created in the north of the city. And uh, this cultural axis, this axis that goes up the middle of the site, is the armature or a key framework element of the plan. And all the buildings, the core Olympic buildings, are arrayed on either side of this axis. We deliberately did not put the National Stadium or any major buildings on the axis because we wanted that to go through and suggest infinity and put people at the center of the place, not an object. Uh, so you see the major uh, sporting uh, facilities, the National Stadium, the Olympic Stadium that Paul mentioned there, the swimming, uh, stadium uh, just to the left, and then an array of other uh, facilities I'll talk about in a moment. And here you see the uh, place uh, in the position of this great axis with all these amazing monuments and civic places uh, going from uh, the uh, Temple of Heaven, the uh, Tiananmen, Forbidden City, and then the Olympic Green in the north. Difficult to see in this light, but that's it in a model form. At the same time, we created a vast park in the north uh, called the Forest Park and extended some existing canals and reshaped them that were used for former agriculture uses, extended them south into the heart of the core Olympic area. And so this idea of nature and urbanism intersecting in the same place, we felt was a very Chinese response. And so the formality and order of the city area uh, in the core and the picturesque naturalistic area to the north was very deliberate. And these, kind of, these places, these parks, would become great civic places beyond the 16 days uh, of the Olympics. And then we linked the uh, the Asian Games Stadium with the Olympic Stadium with sites uh, in the Forest Park that might recall the uh, event of the Games. And these three axes of culture, environment, and sports are some of the fundamental uh, beliefs of the, uh, or tenets of the modern Olympic movement. So we try to invest the site with something that transcended Beijing as well. And here you see a very important part of our plan, which was that it's not only all about Olympic uh, facilities like the stadium, the, sport, the uh, swimming, gymnasium, conference, exhibition, but it's about many other uses, museums, hotels, retail, entertainment, about 28 million square feet of development, all integrated into this scheme. And here you see overlaid how we try to connect it into the surrounding city fabric so that it would seamlessly merge with the city and be accessible and become, after the Olympics, a, a powerful new urban district uh, in Beijing, but one that uh, is intimately tied to the city and its adjacent districts. Part of that was to introduce a series of mixed-use buildings on either side of the sports facilities. And these would be built, obviously, after the games, but would help with the viability, the economic viability, of the various sporting activities. So, for example, the swimming complex might have a future building that would be a, a swimming school or a spa or something related to water and water sports. Uh, and help with the economic viability of the game. So that, again, from a sustainability point of view, was critical, not only integration and connectivity, but economic viability as well. And here you see in this model from the, uh, the uh, Urban Planning uh, Agency, you see the Asian Games Stadium, the uh, 
main Olympic stadium, the swimming complex, and how this connects with the adjacent areas. So you see that very strongly uh, in this view, where the uh, Olympic facilities are simply part of the urban fabric of the adjacent neighborhoods with new and existing construction very much entwined. For the actual Olympics, this is what will be built. So a lot of this will happen later, after the Games. That's very important, this notion of urban design framework within which development occurs. It's served by transit. Transit will be a very much part of this. And here you see, this is our original competition model, uh, where we spend very little time developing the architecture, focused mainly on the framework, and then here from the competition for the stadium within our urban design framework. So you can see many different interpretations of how a stadium might fit into this. And the winner, of course, was Herzog Demeron's uh, stunning uh, building, which then paired with the uh, aquatic center. I heard it very nicely described as, uh, in terms of the Chinese yin-yang, the male and the female, uh, the female stadium with its soft forms uh, and the aggressive muscular uh, stadium making, uh, Olympic stadium making this kind of uh, gateway to the city and from the city to the landscape. And this is a view that we prepared uh, when we developed uh, further landscape concepts uh, for the new district. So this is a vision for the future of what this might be like uh, in 10, 20 years as a great civic attraction, almost at the scale of Central Park in New York. We were also very concerned about what this would be like as a daily place, a place where ordinary people would go uh, and do their exercises and walk and enjoy uh, daily activities. And so if you haven't seen uh, pictures of the newly completed complex, just a few truly uh, amazing buildings. And this is a museum and uh, sort of media complex uh, near one of the facilities. So I'll leave it at that as a okay. very quick introduction. Thank Great, thank you. Um, Ma Liang Wei. Um, okay. uh, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dennis讲了很多的奥林匹克的事情。在那次,在几年前,北京举办奥林匹克中心区竞赛的时候呢, also, you know, my institute also was part of this uh, competition. So uh, Dennis and group got to number one. So and luckily we got number two. <laughs> ah. <laughs> so we just don't want to talk about the So before uh, this month, my, my turn is talking about the Olympic site. So let me talk about something beyond the site. <laughs> 这个中国两千五百年前啊，中国有一个这个教育家孔子，这个他到处讲学，但是他本人的著述并不多，没有写多少书。后来他死了之后，他的学生把他的言论都给他记录下来，然后出了一本书。这本书呢叫《论语》，
much of the works. But then uh, after he met and then his students put all of his parts together and called it uh, Dala. So basically his name is Confucius. 呃，孔子死后大概几十年，西方也出现了一个这个哲学家，叫苏格拉底。苏格拉底也没写很多书，然后他死了之后呢，也是他的学生，像柏拉图等人，把他的言论都记录下来。然后呢，这本书的名字也叫《对话录》。So uh, at the same time, lecture probably a little later than Confucius' time, in the great Asian Greece, there was another philosopher, Socrates, and also he didn't really publish much of the work. His students put his uh, 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 talks together. It's also uh, published later after he had his name in the dialogue. So, both of these uh, ancient philosophers in the East and West, their dialogue uh, changed the world. Uh, there was another also a Chinese philosopher called Lao Tzu. Lao Tzu 呃，他的有一句话叫“道法自然”，这是就是比较出名的一句话，“道法自然”。另外呢，他对这个呃盖房子，他讲究这个呃，他讲这个有和无的关系，呃，就这一套理论，呃，这个这是他自己的一套观点吧。So there was another uh, philosopher from ancient China, Lao Tzu, uh, uh, who was a believer in that. The principle should follow the nature, and uh, also he developed based on that. He developed his idea about uh, uh, from nothing, uh, from none to have, uh, in terms of uh, building the architecture. 那个美国有一个建筑师叫莱特，莱特呢，呃，曾经也读过老子的书，所以对老子比较崇拜。那么在莱特的作品当中，也体现了老子的一些观点。So we know that the famous French poet writes. Famous American architect, he really respected Lao and uh, from his design, uh, reflect his uh, study of the Lao Tzu. This Washington is is this a a French called Lang Fang designed. So that the Washington DC was beginning with the French named Lang Fang. This is the same. In China, in Beijing, Beijing's Yuan Dynasty. 是这个，就是个，因为元大都是蒙古人，哎，这个蒙古蒙古人统治的时时代，那么这个元大都呢，是请的是汉人，当时的汉人来做的设计。Uh, so the uh, Washington DC was designed by French, uh, but in Beijing, uh, back in the, the, the beginning of the uh, as capital city uh, in the Mongolian time, uh, actually was designed by Chinese. 所以，就是说，呃，可能。这个外来文化有的时候呢，会这个根植于另外一种文化当中，可能会更强大、更有生命力。So what I mean is that actually, you know, from the dialogue of the two cultures and two different civilizations, one the other and looking into another, probably maybe uh, can present better. 这个北京也是一个历史的古都，所以呢有很多的改造，同时呢也有很多的保护的呼声在里边。So in Beijing, actually, we're into a uh, uh, controversial and also the conversation between the uh, uh, reform and the preservation. So we're doing this in the Beijing Tiananmen Square project. So actually, recently, we're doing one uh, uh, plan for around the Tiananmen Square, the center of the city. So the Tiananmen Square is basically all built. It's in the northern part. 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 就是那个下边那个紫的那部分，是过去的这个老的使馆区，在东郊民巷那一部分。那个地方呢，都是房子尺度比较小，老房子。So actually, the uh, the around ten square was already uh, uh, settled, but at the uh, uh, southeast corner, uh, there was a uh, you see the, the uh, kind of like a virgin color uh, area that used to be the uh, the foreign embassies. Alleys and uh, the, the house there, and the, the, the buildings there are really old and uh, uh, it's kind of like a low dense, low dense city, uh, low dense buildings. So, we draw this part. How to handle it? There are three ways. One is to remove it completely, 
啊异呃异地重建，另外盖一个大的房子；还有一种呢是部分搬迁；还有一种想法呢是把它能够争取让它完整的保留下来。So there are three ideas how to do that. One is that to totally demolish them and move them the building to other places. Maybe some of them rebuild in other places. And the second idea is that some of them just keep some of them and demolish them. Some of them. And the third idea is like basically and reserve all of those existing old buildings. 我我个人比较倾向于第三个 idea. 那么这些地方都是什么样的什么样的建筑呢？都是过去老的这个在近现代由西方人在那儿做的一些建筑。So actually around this little neighborhood, there were all the architectures designed and built by the Westerners in China. 对，日本使馆。So for example, this is an old Japanese embassy. 对，英国使馆。The British embassy. 这些房子都很漂亮，也可以说是艺术。所以我觉得，就是说，呃，在一个城市的中心区，一个政治性很强的一个广场上，可能不同尺度、不同历史阶段的建筑，呃，放在一起也未尝不可，是吧？呃，多种文化可以交融在一起。Buildings can really fit in with a different style, like a Chinese traditional architecture. So can they can be in harmony? 就是有一种观点，就是认为这种文化要是单一的哈，就是大一统的文化，就是什么样的都是要求，呃，旧的东西全部拿掉，然后全要自己的，完全新的一套东西。就这种观点呢，我觉得这个是比较这个叫什么呃幼稚的。有的时候呢，也是比较危险的一种。好，后面再介绍一个这个这个庄子，这个庄子是也是中国的一个哲学家，他特别崇尚自然，那个。他呢，讲究人生的本来的意义。这个恰好呢，美国在十九世纪有两位呃学者，一个叫梭罗，一个叫爱默生。那么这两个人呢，这个同样跟庄子同有持有同样的观点。这个他们的这种呃对生活的追求，虽然没有对社会做出特别实质的贡献，但是他们的观点，这个观点。影响了我们，是吧？呃，引发我们对人生的这个人生的意义进行思考。So I opened up with the, the last East West dialogue, and the ancient Chinese, the ancient Chinese philosopher Zhuangzi, and he is the one that try to find out what's the really principle and meaning of the life. And at uh, the uh, thousand so years later, so the Harvard Thoreau and uh, Emerson. Also try to find out what's the real meaning of the life. So those two people actually in different time, across the time and space, have the dialogue about what's the meaning of living, and that should inspire us about how our architects and planning should be. 呃，这个最后呢，这个就是看张照片。这个照片呢，是我一个朋友拍的。他的父亲呢，也是一个中国的一个有名建筑师。他后来在美国那个上学，学他原来是在学音乐，后来一次车祸，就把他的人生又改变了。他就不再搞音乐了，就开始用照相机来来和这个世界进行对话。这是他拍的在尼泊尔的一个地方拍的一个一个景象。我觉得他要表现的就是人和自然如何在进一步的去呃融合在一起。So that means that we will be in the dialogue. People in the nature. So here's the last one. This is a picture a friend of mine took in Nepal. And this one, he, uh, I feel, is really seeing the harmony between the human beings living in the nature. 我觉得我们现在呢处在一个物质世界，就是从物质生活上再回归到自然，这是一个很难的事情了
，但是人要从精神上回归到自然，还是可以做到的。我有一个美国朋友为我写了一首诗，在这上面，这个我读不出来，但是我那个意思我知道，把它翻译成中文了。这首诗呢，就算我今天这个讲话的一个结束吧。好，谢谢各位。但愿我的这个讲话没有走题。好，那这样，我再他说个。谢谢 ，Thank you. Good. Thank you very much. Um, Wang Jun, if you can now give us a few words, and then we'll begin our conversation. Okay. 我喂，有声音吗？哦，好。这个刚才谈了很多这个，呃，怎么说呢？建筑，奥林匹克的建筑和这个关于城市的一些这样一种比较抽象的问题哈。但我个人认为，这个城市一个是一个非常具体的一个一个一种现象，然后它也不是由一些单个的一些建筑构成的。Philosophy about uh, uh, living in the city, but uh, my personal view is that you know, the city is not just an abstract concept. Actually, this is reality, and also it's not just a single architecture. It also is a way. 呃，大家都都现在关注北京，是因为说是奥运奥运会啊，在那召开了哈，在讨论奥运会的进度应该怎么绿色。实际上，我个人那几个什么场馆呢？我说实在，我没有那么大的兴趣。Yeah, so now the entire world is uh, pay attention to Beijing's uh, uh, Olympic and especially the Olympics uh, uh, architecture and uh, focus on the design of the stadiums. But uh, my personal way, actually, I'm not interested at all or not very much about what the design of the Olympic site. I think the design of the city is not important. The important thing is how you organize these buildings. The way is the most important thing. So he feels that uh, the architecture themselves is not that important for the city, but how to put the architecture. What is important for him is that uh, how to put all of the architecture together, and which is the street system. What does that make all of the uh, architecture sound? Uh, 刚才那个主持人说问大家职业哈，大家都举手，但是我不知道有多少人去过北京。So, uh, Scott, at the beginning of our program, I asked people uh, what your backgrounds are. So, everybody raised their hand. But now, my question to the audience is uh, how many people have you been to Beijing in China? Oh, very good. Ah, oh. Ah. So, now I want to share my feeling with everybody about Beijing. Ah, I think North Beijing is a green book. So actually, if you're talking about greener good, Beijing is an ancient city, it's a really good city. 呃，大家看这张图就能看到它这个北京就是它，它是按按照中国古代那种风水的理论，它北边要有山，然后南边要有水，城市建设在一个坡地上面，这样的话能够保证它地下有非常好的自来水，能够井水，能够供应这个城市。Yeah, so we can see that the the, the natural setting of Beijing city, the ancient city, that is totally followed the Chinese 风水。Concept that they have mountains and they have the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the land that uh, can absorb a lot of uh, underground uh, water to support the city. 然后呢，这个城市呢，我就说是，也许我不知道这英语英语该英语该怎么翻哈，叫树林里面种房子。它这个城市一个最大的一个特点，它是能够在一种，呃，高密度的这样一种城市环境当中，保保证一种非常好的一种舒适度，每家每户都有一个花园。So I don't know if my English uh, uh, really uh, 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 represent my meaning, but actually it's like an old, ancient Beijing was like a, a forest. All the, uh, the architects of the house like uh, planted trees into, formed into this forest. 
and you can see that you know, all of the housing that is really green. 那个什么，在过去，在上个世纪里面哈，关于城市怎么发展有有很多的争论哈。我看到有两派观点一直在吵架，一派就是认为，就说城市应该疏散，因为城市的很多问题就是因为它密度太高。那当城市疏散成洛杉矶那个样子的时候，就 Jane Jacobs 来批判，来歌颂纽约。但是呢，有的人家就问 Jane Jacobs， 你能给纽，你能在纽约给我们一个后花园吗 ？Yeah, so actually I followed a lot of the, uh, uh, discussion. About uh, urban planning uh, uh, in the West, uh, for example, uh, a lot of people criticize the Jacobs uh, concept that uh, you know like a high density city is more uh, uh, sustainable. And the people ask her that, you know, yes, you know, like uh, you, you can, you, you prefer uh, New York, but uh, actually Los Angeles can offer me a backyard, like my backyard garden. So in New York, can you offer me a living in a high density city like New York? Can you offer me a backyard garden like Los Angeles? So, so, Beijing in a high density city environment, can offer people a garden. I think this is a huge contribution to the city. Actually, the city of Beijing can, you know, like give people a chance to live in a high density housing and housing programs, and also can have your own. 啊，像这种四合院，它是城市一个细胞，它不断的变，多少个四合院变成一条胡同，多少条胡同变成一个街坊，多少个街坊变成一个城市，就是它它相互之间有一种模塑关系，能够快速的生产制造。Yeah, so actually, Beijing, you can see that one courtyard, a typical Beijing courtyard, was a a a, a basic element of the city, and the element that double or multiple of that, and that became the street. And the third street, the same side was the neighborhood, which is Alice, and the new land, the larger community. And then the community, certain set of community, and the multiply of that, and it became the city. So this kind of a pattern, not only really fit into the pattern of the city, but also you can really quickly build up one city. So you can see this map. This map, you can see that the houses are very well organized. I'm going to show you this one. I'm going to show you this one. 啊，都是这样一种，呃，等距离的这样一种连连呃那个那个穿过这个 block， 但是在一些重点重要的建筑当中，它可以打破这样一种节奏，所以它是一种非常简单的一种几何的方式来规划这个城市的平面。Yeah, so we can see that this is the early、uh, aerial uh, uh, photo of Beijing, and we can see that the the uh, the uh, the, the hutong and the alley uh, system is a very uh, uh, geometrically layout, and each one almost like equally you know, to each other. And they just multiply, multiply, and then in the major, um, if there's a major uh, architecture or public uh, or religious uh, building, so you can just break the uh, the uh, the uh, the basic element and then make it bigger. But actually, the whole city is in the same kind of geometric pattern. So, due to the city's layout, there's a kind of mixing of the city's layout to the city's layout. So, it can be very fast and quickly built and produced. So, it can be very fast and quickly built and produced. So, it can be very fast and quickly built and produced. Yeah, so because of this kind of a pattern, that is provide the way that in just a, like a few years they can uh, they can uh, construct and build the entire city. 那么这个北京这个城市呢，还是一个很重要的一个东西在哪呢？就它呢，就是像李坊和市哈，就那边胡和 market， 它呢是这个中国的以前的城市，一千多年前的城市呢，它都是由这种呃，有点像美国这种 gated community 这样一种。来安排这个城市，但但到到到一千年前的宋代呢，就把那个仿墙给拆掉了，就看到那个左边这张图，那么大家可以在沿街做买卖。那么北京城呢，就是按照这样一种方式来规划的。Yeah. So another uh, element in the city, not only the Li Fang, which is the uh, the, uh, the the gated community, but also the uh, the market, that's also uh, part of the important elements. Uh, the uh, the early time the city elements. All of the Lifang was a gated and a closed inward community. But in the uh, Song Dynasty, about uh, the thousand years ago, so because the markets uh, developed, and uh, then the, uh, the Lifang, which is the gated community, uh, totally broken. And then that became an open street system. Uh, I found that it's a very interesting thing. 
胡同的这样一种基因里呢，跟纽约是几乎是一模一样。Yeah, so if you look at the, uh, the, the, the basic pattern of the uh, Hutong system, and they also if you copy with the New York, the great system, their, their, their similarity is really amazing. Uh, uh, yeah. So, uh, for example, in New York, if I'm not wrong, is that uh, like uh, uh, one uh, street is that uh, I mean one block is about uh, six meters by two hundred seventy, yeah. But for the uh, the Beijing's alley, is about uh, eight eight meters uh, uh, by three hundred meters. So they're really close, you know, in terms of the the, uh, the scale and the pattern. 呃，这样一种高密度的路网呢，能够供应更多的就业，因为大家连接的这样一种就业的机会很会很多。所以北京在一九四九年的时候，它每平方公里，虽然它是这种扩大亚，它能够供应这个呃两万多人的这样一种，它能够养活两万多人每平方公里。Yeah, so and then that means that you know this kind of really dense street, uh, a grid system that can provide very dense population. For example, in 1949. Uh, when uh, uh, the People's Republic uh, of China just established, each square uh, kilo kilometer can provide. Yeah. Yeah. So there's uh, like uh, uh, twenty thousand uh, people in one square kilometer. Then. 然后北京的这个老城呢，它没有没有广场哈，没有广场，但它的最重要的公共空间就是它这种胡同和街巷这种体现。Yeah. So there was no public squares in Beijing, but all of this public space actually is the alleys. 所以说北京的例子能说，就是说这个找这个街巷体系规划成功了，这个城市就会得获得成功。Yeah. So that means that if we're really really looking at the street system, that is the the key for the history of preservation for Beijing. 而而且它在美学上获得很大的成功。Yeah, and also this one that's really really good, uh, uh, for the uh, uh, artistic, uh, the uh, uh, showing the arts. 呃，如果你们到景山上去看，你看到整个城市有胡同的地方都是一片绿海。So if you can get it on the top of the Jinshan Hill, uh, which is the top of the uh, city, and you can see if you look at the the alleys, you can see it's totally green in the summer. 然后，但这个老城市怎么瓦解的哈？刚马良伟院长他说，这个这个外来的力量能够使这个城市更有活力，但我不幸的看到，这个瓦解北京这个老城的力量确实是从外面来的。Yeah, so but how Beijing uh disappeared and uh uh this in integration, uh uh Mr. Ma feels that you know, the the Western uh uh the Western idea and uh, and design coming in Beijing and uh, live in Beijing with uh, harmony. But I personally feel that uh, the Beijing's disappearance and that is really the first out by the foreign force. This is the neighborhood unit of the neighborhood unit. This is the neighborhood unit of the neighborhood unit. But this is a neighborhood unit. So I must uh, uh, remind everybody that in, uh, uh, as early as in 1980, uh, 1929, there's an American called Clarence Paris and did a, a modern plan for Beijing. Basically, it's based on a car culture city. And this is one actually is for a suburban uh, uh, community, but it's not really for the inner city. And uh, this one eventually influenced uh, the entire modern China's, uh, modern Beijing's uh, plan. Uh, so because he didn't want the, uh, the kids uh, across really big, you know, like a car, uh, a car jammed uh, street to go to the school. So he make the cities, uh, uh, the, uh, all of the, the community into a super block. 然后呢，这是那个一九四二年啊，那个英国的一个那个高级警官哈 ，Chip 是吧？他他。他把那种郊区的路网铺进了城市啊，他认为这个这个这个城市要更多的考虑汽为汽车服务。Yeah, so there's another British uh, uh, architect also went to Beijing and uh, to suggest you know, to make a big super block and based on you know how to uh, uh, to, to to serve the cars and that's his suggestion also to Beijing.
。然后这是那个呃那个那科布齐埃啊，他做了一个二十年代做了一个要改造巴黎的规划啊，在巴黎没有得到实现，在北京实现了。Yeah, but、uh, we can see that the Corbusier's uh, 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 plan and the design for Paris. Uh, not really、uh, realized in Paris, but a lot of things、uh, realized in Beijing today. 那么这是一种很乌托邦的一种城市的印象哈，因为城市呢它是不是郊区是吧？如果你都用这样一种 neighborhood 来组织这个城市的话，是吧？实际上城市它住在这个 neighborhood， 它可能跑到那个地方去上学。他不可能只只在一个 neighborhood 里面活动。Yeah, if we really follow the、uh, the, the the Paris uh, uh, the uh, uh, utopia uh, idea, so actually that is really not really work because、uh, you know he divided the city into different communities and how the people travel in between them, and、uh, that make it very difficult for the city to live. 啊，于是大家看到就是老城区红颜色部分就是胡同还在的地方，周围全被这样一种体系给给消灭掉。So we can see that、uh, you know that's as a result of these、uh, years, and uh, uh, the red part is still you know you can see the old pattern of the hutong, and but、uh, you can see the black part is the old silver blocks. 然后呢，于是呢，这种大院就在，这是计计划经济时代的大院啊，中国的城市的这规划一直被建设部领导的。建设部本身就是个大院。Yeah, so then all of the uh, the uh, under the uh, yeah, from 1949 to 78, so China is under planned economy system, and then create the same kind of style, which is super、uh, gated yard. For example, the、uh, the, the construction uh, ministry, uh, that's the, the gate of that, and the, the, itself became a, a super、uh, gated yard. 然后呢，现在是。呃，市场经济时代大院也是这样的，用用更多的马路为汽车服务，然后它的城市呢，这个都是都是 gated community， 用墙围着啊，这样一种这样一种状况，实际上城市就这样消失了。And then the, after 1978, we、uh, have the economic reform, so became market economy, but the market economy also created a new kind of style, but it's the same idea, super gated yard。于是大家都跑这个地方来购物，这居然在城市里。Yeah, and then we built the largest shopping mall in the world in in the inside of the city, not really in the suburb. 我一个朋友居然是这个，因为他有五层哈。我一个朋友逛这个地方的时候，他居然是开着车逛，因为他那里面每一层都有停车场。So there are five floors of this、uh, shopping mall, and a friend of mine to do shopping there, so they have to drive the car, you know, to each,、uh, each, each floor. <laughs> 那么大家看到像上海的这个浦东是吧？跟那个那个那个曼哈顿哈，感觉这个城市形象很相似。Yeah, so we can see the familiar outside. I mean the uh, the uh, the sky uh, 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 scrapers from Shanghai compared with New York, and we see oh, they're really familiar. 但你看里面就不一样。Yeah, but if you look at into on the street level, and then that's so different. 呃，一个是郊区，一个是城市。Yeah, one is still the city form, and the other one is the big suburb. 然后呢，他们的交通是采取不同的方式。So and also we choose a really bad uh, 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 transportation pattern. 然后，于是呢，大家在中国越来越多人消费汽车，是吧？我用的这个是那个芝加哥的那个那个那个图像。And then actually we follow American. We're going to encourage people to use more and more cars. 现在这个汽车要跟人吃一样的东西了，所以说去年的这个粮粮价涨得一塌糊涂。So now the the, the cars uh, uh, kind of like compete what are the, the human food now. <laughs> so the uh, the uh, the uh, the real food price is going up, going up. So that means the cars compete with our food. 那么呢，奥运会之后呢，在北京有一个很好的一个变化，就是修修编的一个新的规划，要决定把老城和新城分开发展。Yeah. So actually, the uh, the uh, the uh, uh, Olympic. Uh, uh, give us, uh, give us, uh, give us Beijing a chance uh, to look at a new uh, uh, urban planning. So this is in the, in the 2005, uh, Beijing set up a new master plan. So that's realized that actually the need to uh, the city need public transportation. 啊，奥运会给北京最好的一个贡献，不是那些什么鸟巢啊，这些这些奥运会建筑，而是这个地铁。Yeah, so I believe that the 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 uh, the, uh, the the most important contribution that Olympic to Beijing is not the uh, the uh, uh, the bird nest or the uh, the the water cup. Uh, actually, is the uh, the new subway system. 啊，你看，像今年就有十一条地铁在线路在线。
So actually, uh, 11 lines of the subway were under construction, and then they're going to finish before the, uh, the uh, Olympic. 然后呢，还使用清清洁的能源哈，在一些受保护，他现在扩大了胡同的保护的范围，于是呢就把这些什么电呀和那个那个市政设施接接进去，让大家不用烧煤了啊，我觉得这是非常好。Yeah, so and also under pressure, and then uh, they're going to use the clean uh, energy, especially in a lot of uh, historical uh, neighborhood, uh, the first time introduce the natural gas for people to use. 啊，然后也在上海也也出现这么一个 big deal， 是吧<笑> ？So in China we have everything step with American way. For example, in Shanghai we're going to have the Shanghai big dig. 所以说这个中国的规划师一直在向美国学习。So actually, uh, the Chinese planning is a step every step after American planning. 而他们现在已经开始向 Jacobs 学习了。Jane Jacobs. Oh, actually, we just turned that uh, we should really learn from the Jane Jacobs. Yeah, so actually, this is some of my feeling about uh, uh, my understanding of the Beijing city. Yeah, so actually, uh, that's what we should learn from our own ancient cities. And basically, is that the humanistic scale is our heritage. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I think you can probably now all tell, understand why Wang Jun is considered Jane Jacobs' greatest acolyte in China <laughs> right now, actually. Um, let me start by uh, trying to delve into a, a conflict that I think Wang Jun uh, alluded to, which is the sense that uh, Ma Liang Wei gave us of uh, both Western and modern ideas in some harmony, or at least aspiring to harmony with ancient Chinese ideas and Wang Jun's view that they're in conflict with one another, uh, even if ultimately another Western idea, which is the sort of the, the views of Jane Jacobs, become the uh, resolution of the conflict. But put that aside for the moment. Um, I see two very different views emerging, and we'll get to Dennis and the Olympics again in a moment, but just if we look at Beijing in a more general way, uh, one a view that uh, there is a dialectic that is resolving itself in a harmonic way, and another that there is conflict that will remain unless certain principles are accepted. Can either of you comment on that a little bit? Let us in on that, please. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, okay. Yeah, but the thing is that uh, um, uh, sometimes what, what I feel is that you know, when uh, the, the foreign power gets into uh, uh, the domestic uh, culture, sometimes it's very powerful, and mm -hmm. very strong, very strong. But apart from the strong, it doesn't mean they're always right. So, if the power is strong and unified, this is the best. But if the power is strong and unified, it's the best. 不好的就不和谐的，结果就像这个肿瘤，人体的那个肿瘤一样，就是它跟所有周围环境和谐。So uh, uh, powerful is good, but if you can uh, really fit in and create a harmonic combination with the local, that's a good one. But if it's not, just like cancer, cancer is very strong. It's not really nasty. I think it's also important not to make a simple 
uh, confusion or conflation of Western with modern and Chinese with ancient. I think it's too simplistic. Do you agree? Oh, it's too simplistic. So yes, that's a very simplistic. Yeah, much too simple. Exactly. Dennis, you spoke of the importance of the Olympic Master Plan, uh, not only respecting Beijing in a larger way, and of course the importance of the Axis, but of somehow being Chinese and not being uh, what one might do in Sydney or Barcelona or what have you. Uh, what other than the Axis marks it as specifically Chinese and specific to Beijing? Um, a number of things. One was uh, the relationship of the city to nature, mm -hmm. the idea of this forest park and its uh, landscape uh, suggesting an infinite landscape, an mm -hmm. infinite horizon, even though the city is growing, uh, the site did represent the very edge of the city, and yet the city continues to grow with its mm -hmm. ring road uh, system, which I want to get back to. Yes, so I think that's. I, very, I think we want to talk about that yeah, definitely. Powerful force in Beijing mm -hmm. planning, but uh, so that was one idea. The other was, you know, we did the scheme with a very small team in our office, mm -hmm. and we had some Chinese designers who were educated uh, in China and came to the US uh, for further education and came to work in our office. And we had these huge debates about where to put the stadium. Should it be on right. the axis? Right. Should it you be off that. the axis? And after we won the competition, there was a big uproar in Beijing uh, about the stadium location and how it should have been on the axis, because that was the Chinese way mm -hmm. to do that. They always put because the Forbidden axis. City, the axis goes right yeah. up through and the middle, examples, middle of the buildings. Which yes. you know much better right. than me. Right. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. But we felt as a progressive uh, 21st century piece of urbanism that uh, we should not do it that way. So perhaps uh, the non-Chinese approach. Yet I think the idea in of other the words, object, In other words, the, the National Gallery more than the Lincoln Memorial. Yeah. In and effect, I think, I but I think the, the object... Yeah, the, mm -hmm. the object quality and the sort of gateway quality of the paired buildings is very Chinese. So mm -hmm. it's a kind of weird combination of Western ideas, uh, Chinese ideas. We couldn't pretend that we were Chinese designers uh, developing this. We have our own ideas as well. So, But I, I think uh, ultimately, to connect it to what was just said, mm -hmm. We were very interested in the site in the post-Olympic era because we recognized that we were not designing objects. I actually agree that the, the architecture of the Olympics is far less important than the district of the Olympics because that will be there for centuries. And it was critical that it be thought of in a more fine-grained way than simply a vast area of mega buildings. Right. Uh, what, I, I was there just a couple weeks ago, and uh, putting aside the Olympic green itself, the area just outside it, uh, the periphery right now, is actually pretty awful. Yes. I mean, there's some really horrible uh, non-architecture. Uh, what will, keep things better when the area within and, and more adjacent is developed. Uh, you know, the, the Olympics and the fact that the entire world would be observing these buildings so intensely led to great pressure mm. to do them to a high architectural standard. And I think everybody agrees that the uh, Herzog and Demuron oh, Stadium oh, wow. and the Aquatics mm. building are remarkable mm. works of architecture. The question is more 
just how much does that mean? In other words, uh, yeah. you can either say that's lovely, but so what? Or that's enough to carry the day. I, I think there's an old axiom about how public spaces last for centuries and mm -hmm. centuries. And as you sort of progress down, you know, from buildings to systems in buildings to what's inside buildings gets mm -hmm. uh, uh, less and less significant in many ways. So I think the most significant thing about the Olympic area is the public realm mm -hmm. that's being created. And I see, uh, you know, as the city evolves that the bad buildings and the poorly performing buildings around it and adjacent to it will eventually be regenerated and rebuilt in maybe There's a better way. some pretty big bad buildings yeah, I now. <laughs> I, I can't imagine uh, them going too quickly because some yeah, of them were built in the last ten, five or ten years. A, a new uh, tower that's in the form of a flame. <laughs> I mean the one right next to yeah. just, just uh, yes. yeah, by The one, yes. That, actually that's interesting you say it was in the form of a flame. Somebody else told me it was in the form of a dragon. And I couldn't find the dragon in it, so the flame maybe is a little bit more plausible. Yeah. Uh, although the thing that is mm. most notable mm -hmm. about that particular building is that it also has a four-story LED or else, uh, sort of panel, huge electronic signboard on it mm. that goes up for four, four stories. But let me pursue this just a tiny bit more. How, will, how can we be assured that these things will be uh, taken seriously, that the architecture, when the Olympics are over, all of the television crews have gone home, the tourists have dropped to a lower level of intensity, and then the still very, very uh, intense Chinese economy continues to build, what will assure that things are built at a level closer to what everybody on this stage aspires to rather than the evidence of what has been built in Beijing over recent years, a great deal of which looks very much like one of the last images Wang Jun showed us, yeah. which sort of looked like co-op city in the Bronx or something. Um, I, how, I, would how, love, mm -hmm. I would love the fascination of the building as object to be replaced with a fascination of the space between the buildings. The okay. design of streets, of the public realm, of uh, the, that element that is actually more long-lasting and which is where uh, the public or the civic life of the city uh, occurs. Is there um, let me ask everyone this. Uh, is there a public civic life in Beijing that is similar to that in a Western city? Uh, Wang Zheng made the, uh, I think, absolutely correct and eloquent observation that the street matters more than the single building. But does Beijing have a a tradition and an urban culture that uh, is amenable to that. It, it often has seemed to me as if it has jumped from the ancient alley culture of the Hutongs, the old uh, alleyway uh, low-rise construction that he showed us, jumped all the way to an automobile anti-street culture. And there's not very much tradition of a street-oriented culture in Beijing. So can that be developed even? Is it possible to create it now? Or am I wrong? And is there a tradition that I just haven't found yet? Can we? Yeah, please, please, all of you, if you have a thought on that. Um, Mm-hmm. 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 Mm-
，房子在不断的变，是吧？所以我就觉得，所以我们在纽约，你们走起来感觉非常舒服。那么唯一的交通的方式，你用大家走走路，多走几步路，然后多坐一下地铁，坐一下公共交通就解决问题了。所以我觉得这两个东西不矛盾。So actually, uh, uh, he feels that uh, New York is a good solution for Chinese uh, consumers away from those cases. New York. New York. You can see that you know the the the, the uh, different hubs, different building change, different blocks change. Yes. And therefore, it's really uh, human scale large. People can walk. People can take subway. Can take public transportation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But there's yes. a giant problem in Beijing. And that is the combination of ring roads. If you saw the plan that I showed, there's some significant ring roads. The city is organized by a series of ring roads and super blocks, which were mentioned. And the combination of ring roads and super blocks is a recipe for long-term serious problems, uh, especially as China's abandoned the bicycle and the pedestrian life and no, no. gone for cars mm. and that kind of mm. transportation because all the traffic is forced onto these ring roads mm. and it's become a nightmare mm. just in the last five years. And the super blocks prevent people from having choice and alternative. There's no network like you see in New York. Right, right, because or the, any other the scale of the alleys is too small yeah. and the scale of many of the roads is too big. And then there's a lot not of an, I mean, one of the things that, that I felt very strongly in Beijing was that there was not enough intermediate scale. Yeah. It was, there was some, but very little. And most of the city is either the gargantuan mm -hmm. scale yeah. of the mm -hmm. ring roads and the wide, wide the gated, avenues, gated or the, the beautiful but almost too intimate scale of the hutongs. And the, 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 the question is the, the inter intermediate scale. Um, no, I yeah. don't know how you repair that. I, that's that's mm -hmm. the question mm -hmm. I'm sort of putting before you is I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't know either how you repair that. Um, it's, it's wonderful okay. as a New Yorker to hear New York invoked as a model, but ultimately I don't Not know that. York. Yeah, right, right. Right, that it in fact can truly happen. Although I did notice that one of the things that was notable about your Olympic plan when one gets to the edges away from the green itself is that you actually had created a kind of street system of, of somewhat conventional blocks that is more like that than say the development that now exists on the periphery yeah. of it. Yeah. So, that was the goal. Yes. So, mm -hmm. Yeah,有个很大的问题哈，我就觉得它就很多就做做规划的哈，没有想清楚，就是说你这个城市是应该用什么样的方式，就交通政策是什么？我觉得不同的城市形态呢，对应不同的这种交通方式啊，你比如像
I wanted to return to the question about um, the conflict or harmony between Western ideals and, and Eastern ideals or uh, designs. And um, I'm curious about the panelists' opinion of whether or not there are models in other Asian cities that are successful at bridging Western and Eastern. Um, for example, some cities that come to mind, Tokyo, Seoul, um, Taipei, some Singapore, I don't know. I'm just throwing some of those cities out there. Whether or not the panelists feel that there are some models out there that might be useful or exhibit a better relationship between, a, a more smooth and harmonious mm -hmm. relationship between East and West. Uh, Dennis, do you want to, uh, since you, um, you work in so many cities, do you want to yeah, I would first say answer that and then we'll see if The I'm most gonna... striking mm -hmm. uh, city mm -hmm. that I've worked in and visited in the last few years is Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam, uh, Saigon, former Saigon, mm -hmm. where a city, at least in the historic core, the, the central mm -hmm. district, very influenced by French city planning, and even parts mm -hmm. of it look like uh, Nice or south of France, mm -hmm. where you get this interesting uh, 30s, 40s, 50s architecture. And what you have there is a very beautiful scale mm -hmm. of intense urban life. So you have small blocks, small parcels, uh, amazing density mm. and activity and overlap of program. This was a, you know, something that I think in the Pudong area of Shanghai was, uh, they did the opposite really yes. with the mega blocks again and the mega towers and the mega projects. And uh, they really missed this kind of Asian urban life and urban activity, very street oriented and very diverse in its uh, uses mm -hmm. that are very mm -hmm. much entwined with each other. Yeah. Uh, uh, did, you, did you want to comment, either of you? Uh, mm -hmm.呃,很难正面回答。我就想这样说吧,就想起这个,俄国有一个作家说,这个是,是那个是叫,托尔斯泰吧,写的那本书。呃,那个安娜卡雷娜是托尔斯泰啊。他第一句话就是说
lessons of what not to do mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. and also pick up on some of the uh, other characteristics. Right. But uh, one thing yeah. I would point out is that, you know, one way might be, and I've seen this in Beijing now, is a way forward might be demonstration projects that show another way of thinking. Mm -hmm. and, they're, and they're usually done by Chinese architects, very talented young Chinese architects. Yang Ho Chan, who's now at MIT. At MIT, yes, he's, he's is, very good. He's doing work that, what I find interesting about it, projects in Beijing that are fine-grained, mm -hmm. uh, they're kind of 21st century interpretations of the Hutong yes. spatial idea, uh, but they show another way of looking at, at cities and urbanism and architecture, as opposed to, say, the Stephen Hall. I know the Stephen Hall project is very interesting and dynamic, but it's just another super block. Yeah. And I'm not so sure that's a good uh, demonstration for the future of design in Beijing. And there, you know, I think that's a very good point. And there is an, a, an extraordinary and increasingly visible generation of younger Chinese architects whose work is becoming more and more conspicuous, I think, uh, which, which is definitely in, yeah. encouraging. Let's try to squeeze in one or two other quick questions. Uh, yes, sir, there. Um, um, this is for Dennis, I think. <laughs> uh, could you tell us what, if any, uh, concepts of sustainability are incorporated in or uh, embedded in the plan of the of the of the uh, Olympic Village or the the, the Olympic District. Yes. Um, well, you can think of it in a number of ways. In our plan, which was a sort of urban design vision for the district, it's really a framework plan. A number of factors. One is that we very much try to make it a seamless integration with the surrounding district, so that. People might actually walk to it, uh, and it would, from an economic point of view, uh, become very much part of the city. Unlike, say, the Sydney Olympics, which is a stunning example of uh, sort of sustainable design as a place, but far removed from the real urban areas of Sydney, and uh, isolated and hardly used. So we very much try to make it part of the city. We try to develop a scheme that would accept and work with transit at its core. And we also uh, promoted mixed uses that would uh, integrate the sports facilities and the public spaces with uh, a lot of other urban uses that contribute to urban life. So it was... Uh, very much at our, in our minds that we were designing a district, an urban district, not an Olympic uh, facility or some sort of Olympic district. That the Olympics were just one component of it, very important, but certainly one component. Right. Good. Uh, and Good. There were also a lot of other mm -hmm. ideas about the landscape and the sort of natural systems, and then the architecture was dealt with by others. Right, which is a separate, separate matter. Um, we're almost at our German time, but we can squeeze in one or two quick ones if, uh, yes, sir. Um. Uh, no, the one um, plan, show, a 2005 vision of, of urban planning, and it didn't show any ring roads on it. Was that just a, a fantasy plan for the future of Beijing, or was that something that, that is being worked toward? Uh. Uh, Actually,在某种意义上是有一种想象在里面。但是在做这个规划的时候,产生一个非常大的一个争论,就在这个规划师内部。Oh. There was a huge debate within the planners. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so how do you depend on city if you outside that? But we are, they are still building new ring roads farther out, right? Yeah. But at the same time, you know, when people talk about you know, doing something new, mm -hmm. the old plan, the plan is still ongoing. Yes. Right,他那个什么在东部呢，规划一个很重要的一个新城，那个新城呢，这个怎么发展，是吧？有很多人建议就是说应该中央政府的行政区搬到哪里。So in the the fantastic way, the trying to move the city center to the east of Beijing, many people suggest that the central part should move over. 其实我很遗憾哈，我就觉得这个北京有一个次序搞颠倒了哈，就说是奥运会申办下来之后再来修建这个规划，是吧？因为它是。之前呢，就已经把那些这个，你比如说像这个奥林匹克公园摆在什么地方，都摆在中心城里边了。如果之之前有这么一个要发展新城的规划的话，那么这样的话应该把那些设施摆到那个新城去。So actually, if you said it's kind of in terms of process, upside down. And the the two five master plan is after Beijing got the the tickets to host the Olympics. Yes. And uh, if this one should be even this one than before, so probably much better. But now is that they already made a decision where to put the uh, uh, village, where you know to put you know whatever the important uh, things. And after that, actually, the new plan has to be introduced. But now, I just feel that I, I, I now feel very 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 fortunate. Ah, just just in the organizing of the Olympics process, because of the traffic and traffic congestion, these kind of things. 使他们认识到问题非常严重，使政府认识到问题非常严重，于是呢才才来修编一个新的规划。所以，我我就觉得我都不该，我都不知道该该怪谁了，你知道吗？Yeah, so I have a really complex, complicated feeling about you know the government figured out the transportation problem is that during the time for the and then the final congestion is a transportation problem because of trouble. And then that's the first time to go ahead to redo the plan to solve the problem. It's not really the plan that you serve, the plan you serve at the other day. So that's why it made me feel so complicated, you know, complicated you know, feeling about what's, you know, is a new plan is a good thing or a bad thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, Beijing is not the only city in the world that is uh, trying to, we're sort of fighting yesterday's war in a sense. <laughs> that is, that is, trying to solve today's problems with yesterday's solutions. I mean, that is certainly a, something it often shares with other cities, cities around the world. Um, we are unfortunately, I know we could go on for another hour, but we are unfortunately already at the, uh, past the adjournment time that the museum has uh, asked us to hold to. Uh, so thank you all very much for being here, and please join me in thanking the panelists for their participation. Thank you. Thank you.